Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord, deliver us. That's from an old Cornish litany, and I quote it every Halloween. I'm excited to spend my first Hellbent for Horror Halloween with you guys. Happy Halloween to all of you who celebrate like I do, which is from October 1st until November 2nd. Yes, I take in Samhain and Day of the Dead, of course. And I'm sure there's more than a few of you out there listening to this podcast, at least in the United States, that celebrate month long just like I do. Actually, I know there are. We Halloween adults are a growing minority proudly flying our freak flags. In a recent article, Forbes magazine states that 13% of American adults between the ages of 18 and 44 say Halloween is their favorite holiday. Six million adults intend to dress as a witch this year, and 3.2 million will dress as vampires. Now, the article also says that a million will dress as athletes or political personalities, but I'm a Halloween snob and I don't count them. You go scary or you go home. Two in three of those who love Halloween believe in ghosts, and 33% claim to have actually seen a ghost, and 28% believe that people can really put a curse on someone that's going to work. It is predicted that Americans will spend $8 billion on costumes, decorations, and candy this year. Yes, that's B as in billion. And it's not just Americans either. The holiday has started to grow in Japan, and Great Britain has seen a 700% increase in adult costume sales since 2009. I'm finally in with the in crowd. Now, it's probably no surprise to anyone that I absolutely love Halloween. I've been fascinated with the holiday since I was a kid who wasn't allowed to celebrate it. Sure, part of my fascination is because it was forbidden fruit for me as a child, but that's not all of it. My family believed that demons walk the earth. But at Halloween, so did everybody else. Oddly enough, Halloween was the only time of the year when everybody seemed to think like I did. Kids would start to talk about how their grandpa saw a ghost in the basement, or they heard voices coming from holes in the ground. See, stuff like that felt very natural to me. Finally, we had common ground. Unfortunately, my parents felt that dressing up as ghosts and ghouls was tempting the demons that sit around waiting to possess somebody, so the Halloween parties at my elementary school were considered dangerous affairs. I was always sent home on the day of the party, so I didn't get to be part of the community, and of course, that's the part I really wanted. But my parents pulled the plug like I wanted to play in a TB ward. Now, by the time I was in sixth grade, I was sneaking off to walk the streets on Halloween night and hiding in bushes to watch trick-or-treaters walk the neighborhood. And by seventh grade, I was hiding a costume in a bag in a nearby abandoned house so I could go to parties and walk amongst the other dead kids. But before that, the only way I could get my fix of being in that community around Halloween that I craved so much was through my elementary school music class. Now, I can't remember if we had music class every day, but we had it at least two or three days a week. My parents couldn't pull me out of class every day, so I was on the honor system to not sing any of the Halloween songs. Yeah, that was going to happen. I still remember many of those old songs we used to sing, like, There was an old woman all skin and bones, ooh. There was a song with a cha-cha beat called, There is a haunted house in town, in the town. There was also a version of East Side, West Side with Halloween lyrics. I can't remember the name of the actual song, but it goes East Side, West Side. East Side, West Side, all around the town. The pumpkins shine in the windows and the leaves are falling down. Listen, (laughs) I won't torture you with my singing. The point is, at that time, these songs were the soundtrack to October and Halloween for me. And thanks to the hysteria of my parents, 
singing them did feel like an incantation. It felt like a spell had been cast, like I had summoned Halloween to me. So even though these songs were silly, there was always something scary deep inside them. They were certainly scary when you sang them alone while you walked through a park and the wind whipped up the leaves. Some songs just carry ghoulies and ghosties, whether they intend to or not. Now, I'm a big music lover, and I've always had a soundtrack to Halloween. I have a playlist of songs that I go to while I make Halloween decorations in my garage or I decorate the house. I play the songs while I draw or I paint. And if I need inspiration, I even put on headphones and play the songs while I walk alone in the park at night while the wind blows the leaves. This is all ritual. And music is a key ingredient to ritual. Music brings all kinds of monsters to me. And I'd be a terrible host if I didn't share them. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give a list of some of the songs from my personal Halloween playlist. These songs are picked for different reasons. Sometimes it's because the sound is so overwhelmingly creepy. Sometimes it's because the sound is so sparse it's creepy. Many times it's because of the content of the lyrics. I'll give some insight about the song and the artist and any other little tidbits. I'll also be posting links in my story notes for each song so you can add them to your Halloween party playlist if you want. If you want fewer guests to stick around at your party, that is. Because I'm going to stay away from the standard stuff like Monster Mash and Dead Man's Party and Jumping Gene Simmons' Haunted House or The Blob or the theme to Psycho or Halloween. I have a feeling you've already got those. My list is a horror list, which means my playlist is designed to induce fear, dread, or shock. Not every song will do that for everyone, because we are all different. But I shoot for a cumulative effect. How do you feel two hours into these songs? And you might already have all these songs in your list, and if you do, congratulations. But if I can add one creepy song to your list, or creep you out once at least... My job is done. Oh, and just assume that you are supposed to listen to these songs alone, in the dark. Now, I want to start out this list with a murder ballad or two. If you listen to episode 10, The Restless Interval, I talked about murder ballads. These were songs about an allegedly true murder crime, and the songs are told either from the killer or victim's point of view. One of the most popular and most covered murder ballads was Pretty Polly. It's a story of a man who pretends to court a woman seemingly for sex, but when he takes her into the woods, he takes her to a shallow grave. It's been covered by everyone from the birds to Judy Collins, but I prefer Bela Fleck and Abigail Washburn's version of Pretty Polly because a lot of the versions of this song either speed up the tempo for bluegrass, it's a big bluegrass song, or they water down the lyrics. But in this version, there is only the sound of a lone, slow banjo. That slow tempo matches the feel of a woman slowly walking to her death. And Washburn's voice is ghostly. And it is perfect for capturing the things that are really disturbing about this story. Because it's the stalking of the woman and the pitiless cruelty of our narrator that make this song what it is. These lyrics. Billy, oh Billy, I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid you mean to murder me and leave me behind. Polly, pretty Polly, you're guessing about right. I've been digging your grave for the best part of your life. Give a listen to Pretty Polly by Bela Fleck and Abigail Washburn. Now there are still murder ballads today, and my next song is a modern one. Country Death Song by the Violent Femmes. It's a story of a farmer who is starving to death of his family in the wilderness. He is driven to madness and murder. These lyrics. It was at that time, I swear I lost my mind. I started making plans to kill my own kind. The song makes us witnesses to his crime. He takes his youngest daughter for a walk, only to toss her into the well. The violent femmes alternate between a single heartbeat bass line to a cacophony of sound from traditional folk instruments that keep us off balance. 
You want darkness? This lyric. She was screaming as she fell, but I never heard her hit. That's Country Death Song by the Violent Femmes. Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds released an album called Murder Ballads, which I highly recommend. It's a mixture of real ballads and his own take on murder ballads, and any of the songs that are on that album would fit perfectly into a horror playlist. But I pick his magnum opus, O'Malley's Bar. A man walks into a bar. He knows the bartender by name. He orders a drink. His face is known by the regulars at the bar. His presence barely registers with them until he pulls out his gun and shoots the bartender. 14 minutes later, we are at the end of a massacre told in the first person by the killer. A very, very graphic massacre. Now, the gore isn't the scary part. At some points, the gore teeters on comedy. What's scary is the inner monologue of the killer mixed with what our minds see and how we might react to the things he says out loud if we were sitting there on a bar stool. These lyrics. When I shot him, I was so handsome. It was the light. It was the angle. It's the unstable, self-absorbed madness that scares us. He calls his victims friends and neighbors. He tells them he holds no grudges against them right before he guns them down one by one. He puts his gun to the temple of one victim and says, Did you know I lived in your street? The man says he had no idea, right before his head is blown off. Nick Cave's mad poetry mixes with a gristle, and there are too many horrible, beautiful lyrics to discuss here. Needless to say, this song will definitely set a tone at your party. That's O'Malley's Bar by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. And for a second shot of Nick Cave, I recommend the song Do You Love Me, parts one and two. These two songs are about madness and evil masquerading as love. And those people that are the recipients of that love. Of course, when we talk of Halloween or Samhain in the old religion, we talk of the night where the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest. This next song evokes the chill in the air, the spirits in the air, and the feeling that there are things hiding in the dark that won't leave until daylight. David Sylvian's The Devil's Own is more eerie than scary, but the deliberate pace of the solo piano is a slow build thanks to the subject matter. These lyrics. The night is dark and cold. The strong winds and the rain crack the branches upon my window. The devil beats his drum, casting out his spell, dragging all his own down into hell. This song is haunted by ghosts and time that passes too slowly as the narrator waits for dawn. You might just find this subtle little song giving you a chill when you least expect it. That's The Devil's Own by David Sylvian. I have one band that, when I hear any of their songs, I immediately think of Halloween. I think of dread. I think of darkness and horror, even though they aren't considered in that category. That band is Alice in Chains. Yes, I know. Most of their songs are about addiction and isolation and the rage that's caused by it. But to me, that's just another kind of demonic possession. But the reason I think... This is horror music. Alice in Chains uses dark, disturbing lyrics and musical compositions to personify addiction and isolation and madness and makes them real monsters. It's as if addiction and madness are sentient and chasing after our narrators. As the lyrics of the song We Die Young says, scaries on the wall, scaries on his way. The song is about young boys, 10-year-olds, in gangs, dealing drugs and getting killed. Death is stalking these young children in the song, but doesn't just kill their bodies. It kills their childhoods and their innocence first. This is a world where it's your fault if a bullet finds you, and you should have known better. And they steal the sneakers off your dead body. And that brings me to a second Alice in Chains song that's in my playlist, Them Bones. I still remember getting the CD for the album Dirt. 
This was back when the technology was still pretty new, and sometimes it took a while for the CD to load up and play. Sometimes you had to pull them out and load them again. Allison Chain's Dirt was doing that to me. After a long pause waiting for it to load, I walked across the quiet apartment to reload it. And that's when the intro, ah, them bones blasts on at full volume. I jumped so high I nearly hit the ceiling. This song is all about mortality. But this isn't a melancholy observation about death. This is about the terror of death slowly clawing towards you. There is a repeating crunch of guitars that sound like something big slowly closing in on you. And that sound is punctuated by shouts of fear all the way through the song. Trick or treat indeed. That's Them Bones and We Die Young by Alice in Chains. Some songs just sound evil right out of the gate in the first chords, and they never let up. That's how I feel about Twist of Cain by Danzig. The song is anchored by a twisty, dark, and sexual guitar riff, which is perfect because this is a song about the euphoric, seductive joy of releasing the dark heart to commit murder. Our narrator talks about how he's numb to the world until he commits his crime. He feels this twist of Cain jabbing at him from the inside, like another entity, cutting at the numbness until he comes alive. And when he comes alive, someone else ceases to exist. There is Cain and there is Abel in every heart. Our narrator knows what he is, and he is fine with it. These lyrics. I know my breeding, I know my father, he was born of light. Not my father is the light, but he was born of light. Born of light, but no longer in the light. His twist of Cain comes from the God below. What makes this song so creepy is how defiant and celebratory it is about the act of committing murder. There is no sorrow. If there was a struggle of conscience, it was short. This is howling at the moon. This is someone finding the horrible truth about themselves and not blinking an eye. That's Twist of Cain by Danzig. And here's another song that goes to show that know thyself isn't exactly a healthy thing always. Peter Gabriel warmed everyone's heart with the song Your Eyes, especially when it was used for that iconic boombox serenade in the movie Say Anything. Well, years earlier, Peter Gabriel wrote a song about a guy who decided to go inside the house instead of waiting outside. Uninvited. In the song Intruder, our narrator is proud of his craftsmanship. He knows how to open windows and doors and slide across creaky floors, and he knows how to cut telephone cords. But what's really scary is that he's not particularly concerned if you hear him or not. In fact, he likes it better if you do hear him, because he's not leaving anyway. These lyrics. I like to feel the suspense when I'm certain you know I am there. I like you lying awake, your bated breath charging the air. I like the touch and the smell of all the pretty dresses you wear. The music has slow, pounding drums that sound like industrial machinery. And Peter Gabriel sings like he's so excited by the invasion that he might just laugh with glee. But the moment that makes this Halloween territory is how he sings the line, no, how he shouts the line, intruders happy in the dark. You almost feel that he's just screamed that inside the dark house that he's creeping around in, like he forgot that internal voice. Because he's really hoping that you're lying in bed, terrified. That's Intruder by Peter Gabriel. However, the scariest song about obsessive relationships goes to Elvis Costello for his song, I Want You. This song is like a Rorschach blot, and it seems to be about whatever your worst relationship trauma was. Some people, mostly men, see this as an inner psychotic break after their lover cheats on them. And others, mostly women, see this as a song about the obsessive and dangerous ex-boyfriend who will not go away. Now the song reveals that the relationship is over, but nowhere does it say that there was infidelity. I believe it's the obsessive, dangerous boyfriend. And when I listen to this song, I imagine he's got her alone, trapped. Maybe worse, because the song starts with what sounds like a 
gentle, passionate lullaby. But the choice of words he uses, it's a little unsettling. And then there's this weird guitar twang, and everything changes. He then says, you've had your fun, you don't get well no more. Just what the hell does you don't get well no more mean? The next six minutes is a chilling mixture of desperate proclamations of love and veiled threats that are punctuated by a constant, recurring, relentless phrase. I want you. These lyrics. I want you. The truth can't hurt you. It's just like the dark. It scares you witless. But in time, you see things clear and stark. I want you. Go on and hurt me. Then we'll let it drop. I want you. I'm afraid I won't know where to stop. So are we, Elvis. So are we. That's I Want You by Elvis Costello. Now, let's veer into a little mood music, shall we? Let's try a few instrumentals to get rid of all those nasty lyrics. For the first instrumental, I offer you Black Angels, Movement One, Departure, by the Kronos Quartet. Just turn it on and lean back and think about what visual images come to mind. Mm, mm, mm. Now, for a second instrumental, more of a soundscape, really, I offer you Viginti Trace by Tool. When you listen to this in the dark, what images come to you? When I looked up listener comments, I found that a few of the listeners claimed to suffer from sleep paralysis, and they said that the sounds in this recording were the sounds they would hear when the paralysis started. Now, when I heard this recording, I had a very distinct memory of a nightmare. It involved me seeing an abandoned house on top of a hill. I need to climb the hill and go into the house, although I already think I know what's in there. I don't want to go in, but I'm helpless to stop my legs. The inside of the house is a ruins, but at the end of the hallway in the last room sits a man wearing a black suit with his back to me. I need to go to him. When I am right behind him, he turns, and that's all I'll say. And that's the one-two punch of Black Angels Movement One Descent by Kronos Quartet and Viginti Trace by Tool. Now, I consider instrumentals like intermissions, which means we still have more songs to go. And now we go into the really dark stuff because it's always darkest before the dawn. Do you ever think about tomorrow? Do you ever think about yesterday? Do you ever feel sorrow over what you've left drift away? And those are the opening lyrics from the song Drift by Fear of God. We all have regrets over personal dreams or a friend that we just let float away out of our lives. But what if your very life, your very existence was caught in that drift? You're neither here nor there, neither alive or dead to anyone else. What if you went to heaven and you went to hell and you found both of them empty? All that is left is you, caught in this drift, floating away, praying to rot. That's drift by fear of God. Now, It's probably no surprise a Black Sabbath would make a list of horror songs, but most people would normally pick from a few choice songs from the classic lineup. But I feel that the darkest song they ever released was with Ian Gillen from Deep Purple singing. Disturbing the Priest starts with maniacal laughter from Gillen, and it's his vocal performance, his conviction to the lyrics, that propels this song. This is another song that just sounds evil. Not in the Satan eats babies and dances in flames way that you traditionally hear in metal. This song mocks the pious souls of priests. It questions the tenets of faith. It suggests that religion is a scam. The lyrics. Your life is contradiction because of crucifixion. The devil and the priest can't exist if one goes away. 
It's just like the battle of the sun and the moon and the night and day. The force of the devil that we're all told to fear. Watch out for religion when he gets too near, too near. And all through that song, Gilliam's mocking laughter makes it feel like evil has already won. That's Disturbing the Priest by Black Sabbath. Of course, the evil that men do with their own hands would make the devil blush. Slayer has many songs about that subject, like Angel of Death or Criminally Insane. But the one that really creeps me out is Dead Skin Mask. The song is the internal dialogue of the notorious Ed Gein, Wisconsin serial killer and necrophiliac. The lyrics revel in his sensory overload around the killings, its touch and smell. He is euphoric, lost in his fetish. Slayer goes for a slower tempo than normal, and this lets you savor in the lyrics. Now, the end of this song will haunt you for a little while. Now, if Slayer is just too heavy for you, no worries. Here's another song about a true-life killer cannibal, Sonny Bean by Snakefinger. This song is played on traditional instruments, and the lyrics are pretty graphic. But what will haunt you is the sound of the wind that blew over the Scottish caves that Sonny and his cannibal family lived in and where they attacked unlucky travelers. That's Dead Skin Mask by Slayer and Sonny Bean by Snakefinger. So far, several of the songs I picked have been from the killer's point of view. But what about the victim's point of view? And that brings me to the song Victim by the Golden Palominos. In a way, this is a murder ballad, except it is spoken word instead of a song. And it does not take place in past tense. This is a story as it is happening. For six minutes, we listen to a woman narrate what might be her final six minutes. There isn't gore and violence. Instead, there's the maddening wait and the terrible regret. These lyrics. Why did you pick me? If I had stayed to finish at the library, I would have been there 20 minutes longer. Maybe I'd have been okay. This song is not for the weak of heart. But if you listen to it, you will find the rare song that brings you as much heartache as it does horror. That's Victim by the Golden Palominos. Let's keep that chill going, shall we? This brings me to Subway Song by The Cure. This is a very simple and very short song. It's about a woman who starts to think she's being followed home from the subway. And the only thing I'll say is listen to the entire track. That's Subway Song by The Cure. I think it's time for something a little less horrible and something a little more haunting instead. Johnny Cash wrote one of the most riveting song lyrics ever in Folsom Prison Blues, but I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. This next song, Dealey is Gone is an entire song inspired by the chill those lyrics stirred. The song is either a crime of passion where the narrator travels to Memphis to kill her, or he's a traveling psycho who stumbles upon a woman who he kills but falls in love with during the process. I'm not sure which is worse, but Johnny Cash sings the song with so much loss and so much regret, even when he kills her slowly with a gun. That's Delia's Gone by Johnny Cash. Of course, all of this discussion of killers and psychotic lovers can make you paranoid, maybe even bring you to the edge of your breaking point. And that brings me to Car Chase Terror by M83. Have you ever been witness to a loved one teetering on madness? How about being a kid and having that happen with your mother? Car Chase Terror drops in the middle of a story and we have no idea what's happening. We are immersed in a world of hysteria where everything is frightening. There may or may not be a stalker who may or may not be human. The less I say about this, the better. But I will say that the first time I heard this song, I was pinned back in my chair. I had a terrifying brush with a similar moment of hysteria as a child 
And my God, if this song didn't feel so real. That's Car Chase Terror by M83. Now, some of the songs I discussed gave us an interpretation of a personal hell on earth, like the Golden Palomino's Victim. And some tried to give us an interpretation of a literal hell, like Kronos Quartet's Black Angels' Movement One Departure. This next song gives us both. Back in 1977, Alan Vega and Martin Rev formed the most unlikely of New York punk bands called Suicide. The band comprised of Rev on synthesizers and Vega as the lead singer. In live shows, Alan Vega would smack himself hard in the face of the microphone to the beat of the repetitive sounds from the synthesizer, and he would just stare out at the audience. Even the punk rockers were creeped out by suicide. And their creepiest song is the 10 minute and 26 second Frankie Teardrop. Welcome to the darkest before the dawn. The song is about 20 year old Frankie Teardrop who lives in an existential hell. It is a hell that was all too real in a bankrupt New York City in 1977. And it is once again all too real in this new millennium. Frankie has a wife and an infant, but he has lost his job and there is no money or food. Frankie may be in a city of 8 million people, but he may as well be in the wilderness, just like the farmer in the Violent Femmes' Country Death Song. And... Like that farmer alone in the frontier, Frankie decides on a horrible solution. And that solution is only part of the nightmare we walk through in Frankie Teardrop. But what makes this song intense, riveting, and frightening is the presentation. The throbbing synthesizers increase in their intensity and increase the anxiety of the listener as the song goes on. The vocals echo like they were recorded in an empty apartment, and they are done in a spoken word style, and the lyrics don't follow a standard beat pattern. The echoing voice can enter your ear at any time. So you start to listen. In the same way you look around in a pitch black room, cautious, focused, unsure. And it's when you are listening intently that all hell breaks loose on you. And by the time the song ends, you may feel that you just visited hell. That's Frankie Teardrop by suicide. Of course, no matter how dark it is, the dawn does come. And so I give you an appropriate song for this particular list. Sun Arise by Alice Cooper. Now, when I was 10 years old, I inherited a few cassette tapes from my uncle, and one of them was Alice Cooper's Love It to Death. By the time I got through the ballad of Dwight Fry, I was afraid to move in my room. And then Cooper ends the album with Sun Arise, this warming song. By the end of that song, I was warm again and calm, and it helped me realize that these were only songs. All the scares end when the song ends. Unless you're the victim, or you're unlucky enough to have a bar stool at O'Malley's Bar, or you just met Sonny Bean's family, or you are awakened by your ex-lover singing you a lullaby in your ear, and they're not supposed to be in the house. Sometimes songs carry ghoulies and ghosties in them. They are like haunted houses, waiting for you to visit them again to see the ghosts one more time. And now I've passed on all these ghosts to you. Happy Halloween. And thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. If you got some songs from your personal Halloween playlist, feel free to share them. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. And I've also updated my Hellbent for Horror website, hellbentforhorror.com. 
You can download every episode directly from there, read any newsletters, and you can go to any of my social websites and emails all from the homepage. You can IM me on my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhar. And you can find me on Twitter at hellbenthar. A lot of the great conversations I have with fans happens on Twitter at hellbenthar. Now, for you, the listeners of Hellbent for Har, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for Har. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Har. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me. I thank you in advance. And thank you for listening, folks. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Player FM, and Stitcher. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. It really helps. Till next time, stay hellbent.